Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a really cool guest. I've, I've known about it for years. Uh, Irene Pepperberg, PhD. She's at Harvard. She's the president of the Alex Foundation, a nonprofit devoted to avian intelligence, you know, bird intelligence and conservation. And I remember years ago, there were articles about her teaching this parrot, I think named Alex, you know, I had to speak, I don't know how many words, but it was really, really cool. And it's, it's cool to be interviewing her. So Irene, thanks for coming. Well, thank you so much. Well, tell me, how did you uh, first get involved with, you know, African gray parrots and parrots in general? Well, it started when I was a child, I lived above a store, there were no children to play with. Um, my mother was, you know, this was in the 50s, and um, she really wanted a career. She did not want to be a mother, but, you know, there I was. So she took care of all my physical needs, but not a whole lot of my emotional ones. My father was working full time as a teacher, going to school at, to get his master's in education and taking care of his sick mother. So there were plenty of times when I'd wake up in the morning and, you know, he'd kiss me good morning. And I wouldn't see him till the next morning because I'd be asleep, you know, by the time he came home. So he bought me this little green parakeet, you know, the, the dime store budger agars, okay, as a companion. And, um, I, you know, I joke about it that I imprinted on this little birdie. But, you know, that was my friend, you know, growing up above this store. And, and um, so I, you know, fast forward, I was very good in science, particularly in chemistry. I majored in chemistry, got my undergraduate MIT, done ver did very well. And then I went to graduate school at Harvard. And that was an eye opener. This was, again, the code. So this was 1970s. And very sexist. I mean, no ugly me too type stuff, but just it was not conducive to women. I mean, women could, you know, we were told, you know, well, we can't hire any women here. There aren't any good enough to be professors. And we're going like, well, you're graduating us, you know, hello. But anyway, I, I sort of saw the handwriting on the wall that this was, you know, I, what was I going to do with my degree? And I was getting more and more frustrated with the actual science itself, less and less interested. I think it uh, does say a lot about you, though, that you got into Harvard, first of all, which isn't easy. And you did so at a very difficult time for women. So kudos yeah. to you for doing that. Yeah. So but then I saw this NOVA program on it when that was this was the, basically the first year of NOVA on why do birds sing and on the signing chimpanzees. And on the work with the dolphins and the computer-based chimpanzee work, the, in, the beginnings of the interspecies communication studies. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, my budgie used to talk. Why aren't they using a creature that can literally talk? Why do they have to do sign language or computer interfaces? So, you know, to make a long story short, I basically decided to switch fields. I finished the degree in chemistry, but I was reading everything I could on this new field of interspecies communication. I was sitting in on courses at Harvard going to seminars because everybody, you know, comes through the Boston area to give 
give talks. And, you know, basically that's what I decided to do. My then husband was finishing a postdoc. He got a job at Purdue. We moved there. And I, you know, I won't say it was exactly a con, but it was close to it, be able to submit a grant and to borrow lab space. And then I, you know, got a gray parrot and started the work. Well, what was your goal with the parrot to just be able to, you know, identify if the parrot really understood you or to teach it words or what was the goal? Well, yeah, the idea was to establish two-way communication, to do the same kind of work that the people were doing with the chimpanzees and the dolphins. So the idea was to teach it a basic vocabulary of meaningful speech, you know, identify colors, shapes, numbers, things like that. And then you could test it because you could talk to it. You could test it the way you t- tested very young children. So you could then compare their intelligence with that of very young children. So that was my goal. So what were some of the early things? Like, what was the first moment at which you were shocked or surprised or thrilled to hear Alex respond to you in a certain way? Well, thrilled is the the better word, because I was so convinced it was going to work. I wasn't surprised, but thrilled that it was actually happening. We had him only for a few weeks, and we were trying to teach him to label some toys that he really liked, things that he liked to play with. Turned out the thing that he liked the best was to chew on paper. Unfortunately, think about saying paper without lips wasn't the best word to start with, but he started saying ater. And it was like, whoa, he is really trying to do this. Okay. And so that was when I knew it was going to, you know, at least going to work to some extent. Did you modify any words? Like you just said, I didn't realize without lips, you can't say a P, but um, like, so because of their hard beaks, which letters and words can parrots say, which ones can't it? Well, they can, they actually can say everything. They learn to use esophageal speech to kind of burp the put and the book and things like that. So he eventually ended up, he could say paper. He could say everything that we could say. It just took him longer to learn certain sounds. We made some changes because, for example, we had called clothespins. He liked to chew on them. And so he had other types of things that were wood. So we called the clothespins peg wood. So when it came to colors, red and peg were you know, too close auditorily. So we called it rose, for example. He came up with some labels himself. So like an almond. Okay, the first time he saw an almond in the shell, he called it cork, which when you think about it, you know, it kind of looks like that, right? That's cool. So we called it cork nut. Um, When we try to teach him the label for an apple, he, you know, he wouldn't learn apple. He kept saying banary. And I'm going like, huh? And then a colleague of mine who studied, you know, linguistics, said, well, listen, this is, you know, she called it lexical elision. And I said, nah. And she said, listen, it looks like a cherry and it tastes a little bit like a banana. So he said, banary, and he made up his own word for it. Oh, he knew cherry at that point and he knew bananas? Yep. yep. Oh, that's so cool. And I guess like the cork nut, the almonds probably looked like a cork, right? Right. The almond itself. In the shell, it yeah. That's so cool. It's amazing. Did, were you ever able to ask the parrot, like, why or what do you want or how do you feel? I mean, like, well, how far do you go? Yeah, definitely. What do you want? Okay, because that he could respond easily. How do you feel? No, because to be honest, when you think about asking humans things like that, not an easy question. You know? <laughs> Even asking humans why, you know, think about it. You know, you say to your significant other, well, why did you do that? And they look at you kind of like, hmm. So, but, you know, what do you want is easy. Okay, you know, want to not want tickles, want to go back, want to go chair. So he had phrases like that, that we could ask him. He even learned to ask questions. So when he saw himself in a mirror, he looked at himself. I don't know if he knew what he saw exactly, but he asked what color. And we told him he was gray. So he learned gray. He learned the the label for a carrot by asking us what we were eating. He learned the label orange by asking the color of the carrot. I think I saw a video with you years ago. You said, like, what color? And it was a red or blue or something, right? Is yeah, that how you right. asked them? Yeah, exactly. Just like you asked a child, you know, what color, what shape, how many? Yeah. What time did he address you by name? Did you say, I'm Irene and you were Alex or? No, he knew it. I'm sure he knew his name. He, we didn't use names for people because the students didn't stay in the lab, you know, that long. I mean, they were students. They'd come for a year or two and then they'd be gone. There was one year where we literally had five people named Chris I think it was three women and two men or, you know, things like that. So learning people's names wasn't very useful. So we didn't, we didn't do that. Well, how did he identify people? Like, were there, did he like you or is there anyone he particularly really liked and wanted? 
Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. Well, you know, he basically, I mean, it was clear whom he, which, whom, whom he liked better than other people, but he couldn't ask for us by name. So, and again, not everybody was always there. So there was one student named Spencer that he really did like, and he started to say, sir. Oh, could you say to him, like, where's sir? Where's Spencer? No, he would say, sir, for Spencer. Yeah. That'd be interesting if you showed him like a picture of Spencer and you say like, where's Spencer? Or yeah, do you I, see Spencer, you know? Yeah, we never did that. But um, when I was out of town one time, one of the students showed him my picture and he started, you know, rubbing his beak against my face. So what did this teach you about the mind of, of Alex? Like, what did you learn that you didn't know before about how he thinks and what he sees? Well, I mean, he learned to identify about 100 different objects. He learned seven colors. He learned five shit. He learned concept of category. So he, you could show him an object and say, what color? And he'd say blue, what shape? Or corner, what matter, wood, what toy, block. He understood, so he understood that there were categorical labels of color, shape, and material, and he knew those labels under which, you know, went, you know, green went on, and blue and red went under color, and two, three, four, five, six corner went under shape, and, you know, wood, paper, hide, things like that went under matter. He knew concepts of same and different, not simply identity versus non identity. But literally, you could show him any two things, pull them out of your pocket and ask him what's same or what's different. And he'd say color, shape, matter or none if nothing were same or different. Really? He knew all that? So he had a concept of absence. He understood relative size. And that's actually hard because, you know, you look at something like a tennis ball and it's big compared to a golf ball, but small compared to a football. Okay. But he understood, so what's bigger, what's smaller? He could, t- and when I asked him for two things that were the same size, what's bigger or smaller, he looked at me and asked me what's same. And I said, well, you tell me. And he said, none. So he transferred the concept of absence from same different to bigger, smaller. He understood numbers exactly. He learned by the time, just before he died, he learned about eight, up to the number eight, and he knew them exactly. You could show him and say how many, and he would count them? That's right. And if you showed him like a tray of, say, you know, five, seven, and nine things, okay, different things, okay, like different colored blocks, and you said, what color is eight? And there wasn't any eight on there. He'd say none. He didn't just tell you the number of something close. It was like, well, there's no eight things there, so none. So we had a concept, a sort of a concept of, it's we, we called it a zero-like concept. It wasn't quite the same as, you know, yours and mine. Well, you know, when people, if it's above a certain number of objects, they have to sit there and count them. You can't just flash it into their mind and know. Yeah. I don't so know how many the limit counting. is, but was he counting? Actually, was he going, yes, like, he was actually was he? counting. Yeah. But how, how fast could he count? Like instantaneously? Or did you see sometimes he slowed down to count? Well, it's it was, be, it, we found that it was, it took him longer for the larger numbers. So, yeah. Also, um, he probably was just like people where there's a certain number above which the brain has to change activity and actually count and take a moment. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, and he, you know, he had his little phrases, I want X and want to go Y, and they were intentional. I mean, if he said he wanted a banana and you gave him a grape, he'd take it and throw it at you and go, what banana? <laughs> so he was, you know, he was quite a little character. Did he have uh, moods or like, oh, yeah. you know, did he act very differently? Like what, what was oh, it yeah. like on different days? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, just like, like any other individual, I mean, his, his intelligence was that of about, about a five-year-old. We'd been continuing this kind of work with another bird, Griffin, and he's up to more like about a six or seven-year-old in terms of the types of tasks he's doing. But Alex is the communication oh. skills are only that about, you know, at most about an 18 month or a two-year-old. I mean, that, you know, they don't have language. They can't do what you and I are doing right now. Yeah, but you, in the beginning, there was probably things he couldn't do, and then you kept working with them. And then that was a pretty big repertoire to do what's same, what's different, and size and shape. And 
I mean, how did you build into that? How did you even know that that was possible? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Okay, so we did it. Well, we we built on, we kept building, okay? And we kept building because you think about it in terms of child development. So we just kept trying. Okay, well, you know, if kids can do X, then they learn how to do Y. So let's try Y. I mean, that's the way we did it. And we, we trained him through a modeling technique where we demonstrated to him the types of behaviors we wanted him to learn. So if I wanted to teach say, let's say I wanted to teach him the word, you know, cup. All right. So I'd be holding the cup and I'd show it to you and you'd be the model for his behavior and the rival for his attention. And I'd ask you, what's this? And you'd say cup. And I'd say, good, that's right. You know, and I'd give it to you to play with. And then we'd exchange roles. So he saw that one person wasn't always the questioner and the other, the respondent. And you'd ask me and I'd say cup and I'd get to play with it. Then I'd show it to you at one point and you go, all right. And I go, no, you're wrong. And that's important because he had to see that not any new weird noise caused transfer of the object. It had to be the correct Uh, one. Okay. So that's how we we taught him, you know, all these different types of things. And then we did the same thing with concepts. So, you know, I'd show you two things. I'd say, what's the same? And you'd say color. And they that's right. They're both yellow. The color is same. Oh, so he learned a little observation. So I was wondering, I was like, how did this parrot learn this stuff? Crazy. Yeah, yeah. He learned all the observation. Then we lear- knew that he really understood it because we'd give him transfer tests using objects and things that he had never seen before. What would he do? Well, he'd get it right. And that's how we knew he knew it. No, no. If he, like, if it's a new object, you showed him like a starfish or something. Like, what would he do if it was a new object? Well, we first had to, what we would do is we'd put the new object on a shelf in the lab. We wouldn't even talk about it. We'd just let it sit there. So he wouldn't be scared of it, okay? I mean, it would just sit there. We we put things on shelves, so he wasn't became wasn't frightened. But then we'd show it to him. So now it wasn't it was novel in the sense that he had never been asked about it. Um, he you know didn't know what we wanted to do at first with it, but you know he wasn't frightened of it. And we'd look at it and say, okay, what color? You know, how many? If it was a set, uh, you know, what's same? What's different? If there were two things there, and that's how we would test him. What if you had a lab assistant and you said? The lab assistant said, I'm hungry. And you said, you want food? And they say, yes. And you give them something to eat and maybe try to teach Griffin that. Like, yeah. you know, how to. Well, we, you know, we'd say basically, I mean, he knew things like want to not want banana, want greens. I mean, he could ask us for what he wanted. And within reason, we gave it to him. I mean, just like a little child, you're not going to constantly give them cookies because they say want a cookie. Okay. But if a child is asking for green beans, you know, you'll give them every green bean he wants, right? You know, that's good food. So So like the parent Alex had, you know, about a five year old, this new one Griffin, six, seven year old, but how are they different from people and their wants and desires and all that, even at that age? Well, again, I mean, you're talking to an animal that's even it's in a lab. I mean, it's a the lab is more like a preschool set up, but it's still a lab. So, you know, there's limits to what it can ask for. But, you know, want shower. They could ask for showers. You want to go back, go back to the cage. You know, basically with Griffin, when he says want a nut, we're going like, okay, that means you want to do some work because you get nuts for, you know, rewards for some of the trials. Some of the tasks you do, okay, you know, they basically are asking for things. Sometimes they just, you know, want to ignore us and they just, you know, we want them to climb and they look up and go a little noise saying, you know, no. Um, so we leave them alone, let them take a nap, you know, whatever. I mean, we, we try to go with the flow. Did you ask the parents, you know, nap time or you want to go to the cage or go home and they would say yes or no? Well, they'll say, you know, you say, want to go back. And then they'll if you say, want to go back. And they'll go, you know, want to go chair if they don't want to go back. Or unless I want to go back, if they want to go back. We didn't teach yes and no per se, but they learned a little nut noise. So what did you notice about what their wants and their needs and their mindset? Like, you know, I know you taught them all these things. I don't want to call them parlor tricks. They're amazing. But again, what did you notice? Just Well, they're not parlor tricks. I mean... No, I know. I'm not, they're not, but I mean, like, what, what was your... We're examining, well, we're examining their cognitive abilities. So, you know, a lot of the day is spent doing the types of tasks, for example, like Piaget did with children, all right? We're doing things like probabilistic learning. So you show them that you have this big bucket and you're putting in three, you know, pieces of pork and one piece of wool and you put your hand in and you grab something, you ask him, what's in my hand? And he doesn't know, he has to guess. And the question is, is he going to guess the object that there's more of or the one that's less of? Okay, does he understand the pro- what's the probable likelihood of, of something being in my hand? Oh, really? How was the probability? How was his probability guess? You know, and he does, he was able to, you know, Griffin was able to do things like that. 
we do, we've done very fancy shell game, okay? It's a modification of shell game on looking at visual working memory manipulation. So imagine you have four different colored pom-poms on a tray and you cover them with little black cups and then you start swapping them around, okay? So we did this with six to eight-year-old children who started falling apart at three cups and four swaps. Griffin got to four cups and three swaps, okay? Before that, he was outperforming Harvard undergraduates. At three, four cups and three swaps, he matched them. It was only when we got to four cups and four swaps that he fell below a Harvard undergraduate. Okay, because imagine, imagine this, that you've got these, you know, four different pom-poms under, under these cups and you're moving them around. When we ask the students, you know, find the yellow one, they'd look at us and say, we don't know. And we'd say, well, just guess. And obviously there's some kind of, you know, sub subconscious tracking going on because the students were right, you know, more than chance, not much more than chance, but, you know, more than chance. Okay. I was going to joke and say, like, you should play three card Marley. Where's the queen? Where's the queen? And move it around and see if you could find it, beat the people on the street, you know? There you go. Right. You know, so the point is, these are things that we're doing, which we said things like, you know, liquid conservation. Okay. This is the thing where you show children You have two cups, two glasses. They're half filled with juice. Each of them are half filled with juice. And you ask the child, which one do you want? And they giggle and they say, it doesn't matter. And then you pour one into a tall, thin glass and another into a short, fat glass. And you ask the child, which do you want? And if the child is, you know, five years old or or younger, they'll generally point to the tall, thin one and say, I want that. And you say, why? And you say, because there's more. They say, because there's more. And you say, but you just told me there was the same amount. And they go, now there's more. If you ask a six or seven-year-old child, they may say something like, well, I want that one. You say, why? Well, because it's more fun to drink out of, okay? You know, they know there's no difference in the quantity. Well, the birds weren't fooled. Oh, they they can tell it was the same amount of liquid? They could say it was the same amount of liquid, yeah. So, I mean, these are things that we're able to, we've been able to do with them because we're interested. Their brains are obviously... If you look at a bird brain, it obviously looks different from a human brain, but there's chunks of the brain that work the same way as our cerebral cortex, which is our, you know, the, the part of our brain that is used for complex cognition. And there's a chunk of their brain that works that way. It's roughly the, the relative size of that part of their brain compared to the rest of their brain, is kind of roughly like ours. The neural density is so incredibly packed. It's much larger than any primate of their size. I mean, they weigh about a pound, you know, and they're this the same density of neurons is more like that of a chimpanzee than a, of a primate, you know, the one pound primate, okay? they And they can vocally learn the way we can. So these are very special creatures. Well, does, what surprised you about what Alex or Griffin can do, even well, the, even though you believed it was possible? It yeah. worked, well, but. I mean, the, you know, some of the things that Alex did, for example, the fact that he came up with the zero like concept on his own. We did not train this. We gave him a, you know, we were looking at number comprehension. So we give him a tray of, say, say, you know, different colored blocks of different numbers. And I'd say, you know, what color six? And he'd say blue. And, you know, and he really hated this task. It was boring. And, you know, I was had to get 60 trials for statistical significance. And I mean, after the first 12 or so, he had really had it. And he, I'd bring out the tray and he'd take his beak and knock everything on the floor <laughs> or he'd turn around and start preening. Or the worst case, if there were say like blue, green, and orange on the tray, he'd say yellow, you know, give me colors that weren't on the tray. So one day I come in and I have three, four, and six things on the tray. And I say, Alex, you know, what color three? And he looks at me and he goes, five. And by no, what color three? And he goes, five. And we go back and forth a couple of times. I'm going, there isn't any five things on the tray. But he's not throwing things on the floor and he's not ignoring me. So just, you know, not knowing what else to do, I look at him and say, okay, smarty, you know, what color five? And he looks at me and he goes, none. And we, I, you know, I was thrilled that there was a student there because nobody would have believed me. I mean, we didn't train this, but he, he you know, basically manipulated me into asking the question he wanted to answer. Yeah. And then showed me that he had a zero like concept. I mean, come on, that's that's pretty high level. So he didn't have a name for anyone? Like he didn't call you by name or he just no. he liked you? No. Okay. What what do you said, notice is the difference between Griffin and, and Alex? Griffin is uh, even higher functioning. It's like yeah, what but can Griffin, that bird do? 
They're very different. Alex liked to solve problems. So Alex would do things like, you know, manipulate me and answer questions that I wasn't asking him and things like that. Alex dominated Griffin so much. There was 15 year difference between them. So Alex was an only bird for 15 years, had this, you know, small army of students talking to him every day and interacting with him. And then Griffin comes on the scene and, you know, Alex is going like there's a competitor here. So Alex really dominated him. We'd be trying to train Griffin, say, you know, Griffin, what color? And Griffin would go, you know, start when they first learned how to say the words, they're not that clear. So we'd go green. And Alex would say, talk clearly, say better, green. And really? Griffin, you know, yeah. Or we'd say, you know, Griffin, what color? And Alex would say, no, tell me what shape. So Griffin became this little boy who basically tell me what I have to do to get the A and I will get the A. But, you know, don't, don't I don't want to think because if I think I'm going to get into trouble. So they're very different. But I mean, Griffin's done some amazing work, but he's, you know, he doesn't like to solve problems. He just, you know, okay, if you, you want me to learn about colors, I will learn about the colors and I will learn them perfectly. Okay. You want me to track what color pom-pom is under what cup? Very good. I can do this, you know. But what, what is, you said that he's operating at a higher level. So his well, personality is different. But what can he do that Alex couldn't? Well, these are things that we didn't test Alex on because Alex passed away. So we're just building, you know, on other, other, you know, building higher, higher level things that he's doing. Why did Alex pass away? What happened? Was he just old or what happened to him? He had what the vet thinks he had a arrhythmia, a heart arrhythmia. Did he say any last words to you or anything or, or no? Well, okay. He passed away overnight, but you know, we had our good night routine, be- but we would do every night before we left. So technically those are the last words, but you know, we had this little routine, you know, I mean, I'm going to go eat dinner, you know, you be good. I love you. I love you too. You know, we go back and forth on these things. So, but he died overnight when there's, you know, they came in the next morning, he was on the bottom of the cage. So did he act any different? the last day or two of his life or no, same? No, I mean, my vet said this was like the, you know, the, the human who goes to his doctor for a physical, you know, at 55 years old or so. And the doctor says, you're in great shape. You're going to live to a hundred, you know, and the guy walks out the door and has a massive heart attack. You know, they've just tested everything under the sun and there's nothing wrong with the guy, but you know. Oh, okay. So he died, he died suddenly. So, you know, basically he had a, a, as far after she did the necropsy, she could not find anything wrong. So all they could figure out was that there was probably a heart arrhythmia. Well, I'm sorry that happened. I'm sure you really cared for the bird. And, you know, when he went, it probably upset you a lot, I guess. Yeah, it was very hard. Yes. Well, how long have you been working with Griffin now? Since he was seven and a half weeks old and he's now 26. What tells you that his mental state is at a sixth or seventh grade level? I know, like you said, you couldn't teach. You didn't get a chance to teach Alex certain things. So like, what are some of the advanced things you taught Griffin? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's not a, a, a set year, a six or seven years old, not six or seven grade. Sorry, years. Sorry, years. Yeah. So, I mean, because we're doing these Piagetian type tasks with them and the kids, kids don't succeed until they're about six years old or seven years old. Okay. When we did that visual ma- manipulation, okay, the six and eight, six to eight year old children failed, okay, at three cups and Griffin's going on to four cups. So what, I don't know, how far do you think you can take this? What, uh, what's next to yeah, ask Griffin no. or teach him? Well, right now we're because of COVID, we can't do any modeling, so we can't teach him anything, okay? Because we can only have one person in the room at a time. So what we've been doing is a delayed gratification task. You know the marshmallow task with children? Right, you'll get two marshmallows if you wait. Right, so we did it several years ago for waiting for better, okay? So you have a, you know, you can have a, you know, raisin now, but you can wait for a nut, okay? And he would wait for up to 15 minutes. Oh, wow. So then we tried it with like, well, here's, you know, one nut. Would you wait for two? And he, he would wait for, you know, maybe five seconds. So then we had the idea, well, this is an executive function task. And he was so good on the, you know, tracking the cups, which is also executive function. What happens if we give him not training on the exact tests, but something similar? So what we did was we trained him that little wooden heart. Each heart was worth a half of a cashew. And then we tested him. So would if he, we gave him two wooden hearts, would he wait for three? Or if we gave him three wooden hearts, would he wait for four? And he did up to 15 minutes, not all the time, but statistically significantly. And it's good that he didn't wait all the time because that meant that he really knew that those hearts meant nuts. It wasn't like, well, there's just stupid hearts. I don't care anything about them. I'm just going to sit here until she gives me what I want. Okay. 
and he would wait. So we just submitted that paper for, to the journals. We'll see what happens. And now we're trying to test him to see, did he learn anything? And will he wait now for the actual nuts? And it looks like he would, but you know, I'm only halfway through the, the trial, so I can't say anything. But essentially he understands the math of it, what each nut equates to what other item. Yeah. And he basically, Art. and he understands the word wait. It's not a command. Okay. Because if it was a command. When we give it, we get also give him controls where we say, here's four nuts. Do you want to wait for three? And he looks at me like I'm crazy and he grabs the four nuts. He's not, you know, so he understands that wait is not a command. He understands it's basically, you know, okay, in this situation, this is what I have to do to get what I want. Yeah, that's amazing. So when when you look at Griffin, I mean, do you do you just think about his mind and his intelligence? Like, do you do you feel the presence of his mind throughout this experimentation? And does it feel alien to you? Does it feel familiar? Like, what's what's your overall gestalt of what um, it's like to interact with him? Something in between, okay? Because he's clearly, I mean, he's clearly not a human in a feather suit, okay? There's, it's definitely is a a different type of intelligence, um, but the fact that he can do so many things that children can do okay makes you you know see see some kind of correlation there and see similarities um the interesting thing is that when you're designing experiments with these birds and every once in a while something doesn't work and you go back and you realize that okay it's because of the the way that you know something is going on in that little birdie brain that i'm not realizing because it's different. So for example, when I was first training Alex on colors, he got red and he got green and he got blue. And then I'm trying, you know, orange. And he, I also had yellow. And then I'm trying orange. And he's having a terrible time with orange. And I'm going, huh? You know, he's got all those other colors. Why is orange so hard? And I mentioned it to my then husband, who was a vision physiologist, who said, oh, you know, there's some new papers coming out that these birds see in the ultraviolet. Maybe it looks different to him. And it's like, ah, hello. So yeah, so orange and purple were really tough because, you know, what we ended up doing was taking, you know, a bottle of non-toxic paint and saying, okay, this we're going to call orange. I don't know what you see it as, okay, but this particular shade, that's what we're going to call orange, okay? And that's how we did, and purple, the same thing. That's how we did it because otherwise... I mean, even for us, you show somebody something purple and some people will say, well, it's more blue to me than purple or more red to me than purple. OK, right. Yeah. So, you know, so we would decide, OK, well, this shade is what we're going to call. So they can see in ultraviolet. And I guess are there are other colors. Like you said, they can't see. They can't tell. Yeah. Well, they I can't mean, tell the difference. It's not that they can't tell them. They just see them. I mean, you know, from what think about all the different. Like I said, let's think of all the different purples, okay? So a lot of colors that we see, they see as more colors. It's like being, as though, think about when you were, well, I don't know about you when you were a kid, but when I was a kid, okay, Crayola crayons came, you know, box of eight, okay? Yeah, that I remember they it. kept expanding it to new weird colors. Exactly. There was no more blue and red. There was like magenta and exactly. weird cyan. Okay. Yeah. Right. And that's basically, you know, think about all of a sudden, the fil- if the filter went off your head and you just all of a sudden start, you know, the 64 colors of Crayola crayons, that's how they see the world. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot of blues. And, you know, these things kind of all look kind of like she wants me to call blue. So that's fine. You know, I mean, so we had to be careful. So, for example, you know, if we if we got something that was, you know, bluish green, you know, he'd have trouble with it. We had to be kind of careful about things, you know, having pretty hmm. much, you know, things that we would agree on were the standard colors. Well, were there ones that looked the same color to you, but the parrot saw it differently? Well, that was the orange and the purple. Yeah. Oh, no, no. But like, you know, have you ever seen, have you shown them two blues or two oranges or two purples or well, you yeah, thought you thought it was the same, but they said it wasn't. Yeah. Well, every once in a while, there'll be something where, you know, if we, if we have to use an object that's not that we can't dye the same color, okay, that we can't, you know, get a standard color of. And sometimes, you know, we'll ask them and they'll say something. We'll go like, all right, you know, maybe you don't see this as that color. We'll go, you know, we'll, we'll try something else. Did you ever show the parrot natural? Like, you know, this is kind of funny. Um, it sounds silly, but my wife recently showed me, and I, didn't, I don't know why I didn't see this. Like, you know, when you look at grass, it's many, many different colors. And, you know, a lot of stuff in nature is not just one color. It's right. thousands of different ones. So did you ever show them? 
stuff in nature and ask what color and see if they see something you don't? Well, no, because, you know, they're in the lab. So we haven't brought in like tree leaves or something like that. No. Well, it might be interesting, you know, like objects from nature and see how they react to them. We had one, we were collab just before COVID hit, we were collaborating with someone who had basically a, um, a machine that could tell, could read off the wavelengths of the different, you know, the way the light was reflecting off different objects in the lab. And so she was testing, you know, what the sort of what, where he was getting, where he would get a little bit wiggly. Okay. Gotcha. In the colors. And we were just, we were just beginning to do that work when COVID hit. So. So what are some things that you want to teach Griffin that you haven't been able to yet, but you're looking forward to doing? Well, we're, we want to start a thing on, it's basically on pitch perception. So for example, with humans, okay, you say a word and I say a word and it's at a different pitch, but nobody has trouble understanding that we're saying the same word, right? Well, so sometimes it depends on your accent. Well, I'm not saying of accent, I'm saying pitch, okay? <laughs> okay, pitch, sure. So there was a study many years ago on starlings, and the professor trained the bird to make one response if the tones were going like up, da 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 versus down, da 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 okay? And the birds learned it quite well. And then he shifted the pitch, and the behavior fell apart. And so he claimed that they couldn't shift pitch. And the issue with a bird like a starling is, okay, when you listen to their vocalizations in the wild, there's a little bit like us where, you know, high pitch things are affiliative and low pitch things are aggressive. So if you switch the pitch of something, you've changed the meaning. Well, with the parrots, they have been hearing all these different students for all these years. Males and females, you know, males with slightly higher pitches, males with slightly lower pitches, females with higher, you know, they've had this huge range. So we thought that maybe they would not have a problem with this. And so we were, um, we wanted to test this and see if we could do the same study with the tones going up and the tones going down and see if they could still transfer if we, the pitches, you know, switch. That's one of the things we want to do. We want to look at some more optical illusions with them. Um, oh, do they uh, do optical illusions work on them? Yes, um, the few that we've looked at, they see the same way we do. That's cool. And what yeah. do they, how do they react when they see that? Do you show them that they they were fooled by the illusion, and how do they react? Well, it's not it's not quite that way. So you do you know the the Mueller liar one? Okay, which you know what it is, but you don't know the name. It's like two lines, and then one has arrows going in, and one has arrows going out. I've seen that one. Yeah. Okay, and one of them, what the two lines, even though they're the same size. One looks bigger than the other, right? So you use two different colors for those lines. And we can ask Alex, what color bigger, what color smaller? And he responded the same way we did. And when the lines were, you know, when we moved the arrow, so they became perpendicular, so there was no more illusion, he said none. Oh, okay. But he wasn't like, you tricked me. He was just, okay, this is what I see. Right. But this is, but the point is he saw it the same way we did. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And then there's something called the Kanitsa figures, which, okay, imagine three Pac-Men, okay, three black Pac-Men sitting on a blue piece of paper, and they're in a sort of a triangular shape. And if mm, I I've seen you, it. you know, and you, you see a triangle. Yeah, the negative, seeing the negative space, you mean, right? Right. So, you know, Griffin did too. Oh, yeah. You know that one where it looks like two faces that are facing each other yeah, and it's a vase? Yeah. yeah, we haven't done that because we'd have to train. It would be really hard to train him to, you know, to see two different. I mean, how would you tra- you'd have to train the figure somehow separately and then see what he saw. You know, it would be re- that one would be really a mess to train. But have you, you thought about um, teaching the bird its own body parts like foot or claw or feather and stuff like that? Um, I haven't. One of my friends has taught her pet parrot that. So, yeah, they can learn it. Well, what did she notice? Anything special or no? Well, you know, she asks if she points to a body part and she asks, what's this? He tells her. Oh, but can she say to him, give me your foot or where's your foot? And they show the foot. Well, she can say, she can say, give me your foot. Yeah. Oh, and the bird does. Okay, that's very cool. What's next? You know, with, with Griffin, what do you, what kind of questions or things do you want to test that you're excited about? Well, that's why I said we want to look at this for the short. We want to look at this pitch perception idea. We want to look at some more visual illusions, things like that. Um, we want to finish this delayed gratification task, see how that goes. There are a couple of other things. We want to look at some logic problems. Do they understand the difference between or versus not? 
when when you had Griffin and Alex, did they cooperate at all? Were they just rivals for attention or did they interact um, together? You know, it depended. <laughs> but just before but just before Alex died, we had finally kind of gotten him to work as a model for Griffin instead of interrupting the sessions to help us train Griffin in the sessions. So we were so excited about that. And then he passed away. Was he helping? Like when he, when yeah. he helped? So he would ask, yeah. So, you know, the idea would be, instead of having another student work with me, I'd have Alex sitting there and I'd say, you know, Alex, what color? And he'd say, you know, give me the color. And then Griffin could, you know, well, Griffin knew his colors by then, but you get the idea, you know, so then could model what I wanted Griffin to say. And Griffin could learn from Alex. Did, did that increase the speed at which Griffin was learning or facilitated yeah, somehow? No, because he died before we could finish it. So. Oh, okay. You just got through the phase where he was trying to like one up him, and you, you, you didn't get yeah. to test it yet. Are you going to get another bird, like a partner for Griffin now that would we help have, out? We have Athena. She's now eight. Okay. Griffin, I mean, he tolerates her. He's like, you know, he acts like the teenage boy whose mom, you know, had a new baby. I mean, you know, it's like, mom, you know, and she, she can talk. She doesn't want to. And I'm not sure what's, you know, going on with her. But when she wants to talk, she talks extremely clearly. But, you know, you ask her questions and if she wants to answer them, she will. And otherwise she just looks at you and, you know, just turns around and starts preening. So. We'll are these what, all uh, African greys or are there yes. other birds that uh, no. are maybe smarter? I'm just working with greys. Have you ever tried to bring in another type of parrot, like a you know, blue and gold macaw and see how it interacts with, you know, with no, the greys? No, be- because when you work in the university setting, if you have different species, you have to have them in different spaces and different rooms. Oh. That's, you know, that's doubling the cost of your experimental system. So, no, we haven't done that. Did anyone bring in a dog or anything to show the bird to see what it would think? Inadvertently, okay. And um, depending on the dog, it was just, you know, curiosity. Did the bird ask about it or say anything well, it to it? Like, you know, just curiosity. Like, what is, you know, just looking at it. You know, they both sort of stare one another down. So, yeah. <laughs> well, it's really cool. It's really, really interesting what you do. And so in total, you've been doing this for how many years? Oh, since 1977. I've been alive since 1975, so that's pretty good. Yeah. It's a long time. Well, very good. Well, I mean, what's the best way for people to uh, to keep tabs on your experiments and, you know, learn as you learn? Where can okay. they go? www.alexfoundation.org. Okay. Alexfoundation.org. Very good. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else that you wanted to bring up or do you think that's good um, for the questions? Well, I think one thing is that I don't want people to, you know, listen to this podcast and go, wow, this is great. I'm going to go out and buy an African gray. They do, you know, they can be good pets, but only if you, you know, if you work at home and you're with them all day because they are a flock creature. So they don't like being left alone. So if you you have the kind of lifestyle where you, you know, basically you're home for an hour in the morning and a home in the hour in the evening, this is not the the pet for you. They are extremely demanding. They take a lot of care. Um, I joke that it's like having a a creature that has the intelligence of a five or six year old, but the personality of a two year old in the terrible twos. They're extremely destructive. They don't know the difference between their chew toys and your Aunt Sophie's antique amour, you know, and things like that. They're very loud. They're very messy. Okay, but you know, if you but you so if you want to put up with all of that, they can make a very good pet because they're very affectionate and you know, very intelligent and fun to be with, but there's all these downsides. And a lot of these people, you know, they don't see the downsides. They just listen to a podcast like this and they say, wow, I want a bird. And then they're realizing they're cleaning cages every day, which are really messy. They are, you know, basically chopping vegetables for an hour in the morning. You know, they're vacuuming three times a day because of all the junk the bird is, you know, tossing out of its cage. Um, their neighbors are complaining when the windows are open in the summer because the bird is screaming so loudly. So, you know, this is this is not this is not a pet for everybody. Okay. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that if they do decide to get a pet, to make sure you get it from a reputable breeder, because these birds are now CITES 1 endangered in Africa from all the poaching and the habitat destruction. So you want to make absolutely positively sure that you haven't got a bird that was, you know, basically poached from from Africa. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Irene, it's been a super awesome call. 
I really appreciate talking to you. And, you know, you're one of my like scientific heroes for what you do. It's very cool. And uh, thank you for being on the podcast. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.